It is Sunday morning and we are at Calvary Assembly of God. Let's stand together. We join those, well, across New Jersey, across the United States, across the world, who today are worshiping Jesus. Let's lift our voices. Let's tell Jesus he's everything to us. Sing who breaks. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth? Holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. Welcome to Calvary this morning. God in his word says this beautiful thing. He says, I am the Lord, your God. Do you remember God means the only one able to meet every need of my spirit and my soul and my body? 
They're idols of this world that offer. Say, oh, if you have me, you'll be satisfied. If you have this, if you go here, you go there, you'll be satisfied. No. God said, I'm the Lord, your God. But then he says this. So walk before me and be perfect. Perfect? Oh, this perfect doesn't mean that we don't make a mistake and we have to kneel and repent and come back to that place of obedience. Oh, no, it doesn't mean. It means like a perfect puzzle, complete. He says, walk before me in every single part of your life. Be perfect before me in your walk. Don't say this part of my walk doesn't matter to God because that part will be in darkness that part the enemy still holds. That place you can still be tormented. That place you can still be in bondage. He is the Lord your God. Today, walk before him and be perfect. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you because you're our God today. You want to bring your light and your life and your power into every facet of our lives because you are God oh father because where you are there is peace where you are there's provision where you are there is power oh thank you father today we open our hearts to you we open our lives to you father come touch every facet every part speak to us again oh God we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, he's worthy to come in every part of our lives, for he is God alone. Sing with me. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give. By your plan, that's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. You are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. The only God who's worthy of everything we can get. Yes, you are God. That's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. You are on your throne. You are God alone. It's right. You're unshakable, you're unstoppable, and that's what you are. You're unchangeable, you're unshakable, you're unstoppable, and that's what you are. You're unchanged, you're unchangeable, you're unshakable, you're unstoppable, that's what you Sing one more time, Lord, you're unchanged, you're unchangeable, you're unshakable, you're unstoppable, that's what you are. 
the good times and bad. You are on your throne. You are God alone. Yes. Lord, we thank you for that. That you're sovereign. You are Jesus, you are God. Thank you, Jesus. We worship and thank you. We praise your name. Lord, we're unashamed to praise your name, to lift our hands. You are God alone. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, in every area of life, you've been our, our shelter, our tower. Sing with me, my Jesus. You're my Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to pray. The wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, my tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, let all that I am, let it never. Cease to worship Worship you Shout to the Lord of all the earth Let us see Power and majesty Praise to the King Even mountains bow down And the seas they roar At the sound
Yes, Lord. Lord, we thank you for what we just experienced here, Lord. Lord, the moving of the gifts of your spirit. Lord, tongues and interpretation as you spoke of so clearly in your word. Oh, Lord, come and let our faith be built up as we, Lord, remember, as your spirit has reminded us of the words that you've spoken to us. I will be in you. I will be with you. I will help you. Depend upon me. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, our response to you is yes. Yes, Lord, yes, I will. Yes, Lord, right now, today, Lord, I'll open my heart to you. Lord, that hopeless area, Lord, that I've been trying so hard to do by my own strength, my own will, my own ways, Lord, I turn and I say, Jesus, yes, yes to you. This morning at Calvary, we, we as a worship team, we'd like to, to teach you a, a new song and have you sing it with us. It's really a prayer, almost an altar prayer that says, Lord, I hear you speaking to me. I hear your voice. And Lord, I don't understand everything. Lord, I'm not completely sure of all the steps, but Lord, I do know that the first step and the most important is for me just to say yes. And so we're going to sing that song. Would you sing it along with us and, and learn it and make it your prayer? I see you. I see you standing on the waves. You beckon me to do the same. Surrender's what I'll bring. 
Yes, Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Yes, Jesus. Thank yes, you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Jesus. Don't have to know the question. That's absolute surrender. That is whatever you ask, Jesus. Whatever you ask. As we bow our heads. Now, we sang it. But every single person in here has wrestled with it. You said yes to Jesus in 99 questions out of 100. But there's one that, when it's posed to you, you said, well, I, I don't know. And I'm praying with you right now for your final 100th question, your final 100th yes. Heavenly Father, when we sing a song of surrender, when we say, I surrender all, Lord, we want it to mean all. And yet, Jesus, we stand before you and we worship you, but we admit how human we are and how, Lord, there are times we've said, yes, except this area, except this question, except this moment, except this calling, except, Lord, and we just, we, we do everything, and, and it seems wonderful, and it is, but, Lord, you want that final yes. You want that final yes. It's like the rich man, Lord. He, he said yes to just so many things that God had asked them to do. And Jesus said, well, one thing you lack. Lord, may we give that one last thing to you. May our surrender be complete, Lord. Not because you want to take from us, but because you want to give to us. And our lack of surrender holds back what you want to give. So, Lord, help us to surrender. Help us to say our final yes. Lord, bless. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that I get to be with a group of people and even minister to a group of people who, who literally would sing a song like we just sang and actually mean it. It, it really echoed from their heart. I want to say yes, 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 yes to Jesus. So Lord, thank you. Bless those yeses. Give us strength for the final yes. Be with us now. Lord, even teach us to be ready for your coming. In the great, wonderful name of Jesus, we pray this morning. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Once again, I'm glad to see you at Calvary Assembly. I'm blessed that you're here. You're going to take a moment now. You're going to shake some hands, but I tell you what, we have a lot of exciting young people up here and across the front. Why don't you try to find one of them and shake one of their hands. Take a moment, shake a hand. God bless you. Online, we welcome you. Glad you're with us. All the way from South Carolina, happy birthday, Anthony. Glad you're with us today. May God cause you to grow up strong in him. For everybody else here, God bless you greatly. Thank you. Clean Jean. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you up in the balcony. Hey, I want to say that on that we're thankful when we start to fill up the seats and things start to happen. Uh, it does look like the balcony is well attended. I always want to tell you, if you ever come in and you feel like sitting in the balcony, do it. Because that would probably be where we need to grow 
or in a, in, in a sense fill so that we can then fill downstairs. So if you're ever inclined to the balcony, you want to join those exciting people up there. They're the most exciting people in the building. That's what they're saying. So they're pretty excited up there. God bless you for that. Well, welcome to your church, your family. Um, yes, we can, we can enjoy the church worldwide, but there must be something about the local church family, just like there was a local family that you have as an individual, mom, dad, kids, uh, then grandparents, aunts, uncles. It is your family, and it, it brings a wholeness. Likewise, we need that in our Christianity. We need our church. So God bless you as, as this is, Calvary Assembly is your church. If you're a visitor this morning, first of all, welcome. Glad you're here. We call you a guest. And for our guests, we ask that you do something. We ask you fill out a connection card. And so in the foyer, uh, Ron and Cindy are going to be out there in the foyer after service. And they will be by a sign that looks like this sign over here. They will have a gift packet for you and ask you to fill this out. That comes to me, helps me to send you a text and welcome you. And if you're new at Calvary, big welcome. Big welcome to Calvary. Hey, if you're watching online, make sure that you always, absolutely always, I already got several texts this morning, but anybody who's watching online, send a text. Send a text. It helps me to be a good shepherd, helps you to stay accountable to say, hey, listen, I'm not just kind of a nothing out here in nowhere land. I am accountable to what's going on in my home church. So send a text, say, hey, this is such and such, because sometimes we get phone numbers, have no idea who it is. And just, uh, this is such and such, and there's, there's three of us sitting in the living room here, whatever. God bless you. Hey, Wednesday night, did you know that two great programs along with an adult Bible study go on, Royal Rangers and Girls Ministries? I read something this week that I think would be important. And as I thought about it, and now I'm getting a little bit older, I realize, especially as a pastor, that I have met thousands of people. Not just even hundreds, thousands of people. Thousands and thousands of people, which represents their children, which could go up into the tens of thousands of, of children. I have never met a parent yet who says, I don't send my kid to school. I just let them stay home and do anything they want. They can just, it, it, what, what do they need school for? We don't need school. In fact, I found the exact opposite. Parents, whether they're homeschooling or whether they're public school or, or parochial school, they are big into the emphasis of their children growing up in an education, basic education. There are certain things they don't need, but there are things they do need because they want them to be able to function well and be a success in what we would call society. Yet the very same parents would drop the ball when it came to the spiritual upbringing of their children. The faithfulness, I mean faithful, and that's what it takes. Coming when, I don't want to go, and coming when, oh man, what a drive, and coming and coming. Royal Rangers, girls' ministries, children's ministries, youth ministries, on and on and on. All these ministries for your children but it's going to take the mom or dad who says, I am never going to drop the ball. I am going to be faithful to bring my children to the house of God year after year after year after year. Anybody want to say amen? amen. Oh, I'm just tired talking about it. But I'm telling you, that's what it takes. That's what it takes, parents. And you don't do it with a public school. And it, which nobody goes, oh, we go. Huh. Again, I've met thousands, never met one that said, no. Nope. My kid's not going to school. Every one of them said it's going. That's it. I don't care how much they whine. They're going. Hey, have you said that same about bringing them to the house of God? Have you for yourself obviously done it, but have you done it for your children? I can't say it enough good. And that's why I highlight even our Wednesday night uh, program here at Calvary. We had this past Wednesday night more people in the building than we have had in years. In years. So uh, exciting things happening. Hey, I want to also say that when we're talking about parking, thanks, thank you for uh, those of you who park across the street. We had like, I don't know how many on the, several dozen parked across the street. Thank you very much. Uh, parking there, that, mean, that meant we had uh, several, at least a good number of empty spots out here so that when visitors do come, they can just pull in, park, walk right in, and not feel like uh, something's wrong. Oh, I got to park someplace else. Or, so, or it's too full for me, or something like that. So God bless you. Keep up the good work. Stay with the parking across the street. 
And then finally, I want to talk to you about giving this morning. And I want to uh, do maybe something different, maybe have it, make this a feature, as it were, of reminding you what God has done for us and how we can do and should do in obedience towards the things of God. So the verse I want to read to you this morning with our giving before I just pray for, even though we don't take offering at this moment, but I'll be praying for when you give your tithes and offerings between now and obviously next Sunday or whatever the cycle of your paycheck is. But it says in Psalm 103, verse 10 and 11, He hath not dealt, God has not dealt with us after our sins. He didn't give us what we deserve, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. God's loving kindness to you and I it does not match who we are. He gives us more than we deserve. Can anybody say amen to that one? God, you've been, well, I mean, any of us should say, God, you've been too good to me. Any of us should say that. I'll say it. I trust, I trust you can say it. But on the flip side of that, then you and I would say to ourselves, and we, hopefully we're quick to realize, we would say, well, then, what could I give back to God in any way? And, and sometimes we use this term to repay him, and we could never repay him. If you gave everything that you had, everything you ever would ever have, if you were a billionaire and you gave it all to him, it would not repay his loving kindness. But we can show our sacrifice, our gratitude, and obviously our obedience when it comes to giving the way that God has laid it on our hearts and according to the word. And so I encourage you this week, make sure you are faithful with your tithe. Don't lock God out of your life in that area. Open the door and let him in through the tithe and through your missions offerings. I say it, I almost say it every Sunday, but Calvary is doing a great thing for missions. And uh, sometimes, you're not supposed to be proud, but I am so stinking proud of the great, of, of just missions that Calvary does and how it just excels where there are churches that don't even get it. I am so thankful Calvary gets it. So praise the Lord. And you're Calvary, so praise the Lord. You get it. Thank you for your missions giving. God bless you. Hey, this Saturday, just want to remind you that, the, uh, that we have a prayer time coming up. It will be at 11 o'clock. I uh, want you to just give a report. I want to give a report. We had incredible Friday night, incredible Saturday morning, women's meeting, men's meeting. Both of them were the crowds just get bigger and bigger and bigger. The men, now this is no, this is... They ran out of food, but that's because the first three guys ate it all. No, it's a, it, they just ran out of food. That was, ah, oh man, they just, it was amazing. And they really do cook for an army, and an army and a half showed up. So uh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Um, but anyway, this week, I wanted you to know that we're going to have a prayer time. And because God is doing things, and because prayer moves heaven and earth, I, I'm asking you to come and help us together join as an army of prayers and move heaven and earth on behalf of our own assembly, but literally far beyond that, that we pray for things that are not just ours, but they, they're America's or they're the world's. So we just ask that you come and pray with us. We look for you this Saturday, 11 o'clock, right here in the sanctuary for that. Amen. With all that said, I'm going to invite you to take out your Bibles. Somebody has said that Americans, when it comes to prophecy, think the whole Bible rotates around them. You know, we're not the only people in the world, folks. I mean, just so when there are eclipses in America, when there are earthquakes in America, uh, you know, even when America helps others who are in war, that doesn't necessarily mean, doesn't necessarily mean that that is the cue that Jesus will be here before the sun goes down. However, with that being said, at the same time, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, 
when there are earthquakes in the weirdest places like New Jersey, when there are, when there are literally things going on like the sun is, is just being blocked from the sky, then it should at least be at best a reminder to you and I that Jesus is coming again. He is coming again and it is part and parcel of a healthy believer in Jesus. People who believe in Jesus according to the word of God don't just pick out what they want. They take the whole package and the whole package of the word of God very clearly talks about Jesus coming again. Ready or not, he says, here I come. You ever play that uh, in hide and seek? You know, you put in one, two, three, 99, 100. Ready or not, here I come. Well, ready or not. And I, 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 we're going to preach against the not this morning. We're going to say, Lord, help us to not be nots, but instead to be readies when it comes to your coming again. Matthew, the 25th chapter. I'm going to read 13 verses. You can follow along on the overhead or if you have your Bible or your iPad, phone, I do encourage you to follow there. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, but you can follow along. That makes, that, that's even funner when you pick a different translation and then try to figure out once you get lost, you get, well, what verse is he on? What is this? So that's, that even makes it funner. So whatever you want to do, if you want to go with New Living Translation or pick something else and, and get lost in the weeds somewhere, I don't know. But anyway, the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is Jesus speaking. So very important. Jesus said, let me tell you what the kingdom of heaven is like. It can be illustrated by the story of 10 bridesmaids. Let's think back to the many weddings we have all been to. Let's think back to your wedding if, if, you've been, if you're married. So let's, let's think about these weddings here. In this particular one, boy, did they go whole hog. Ten bridesmaids. Ten bridesmaids. Of course, it was a different time and a different way to do it. But they took it their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, five of them were foolish and five were wise. That we want to emphasize that because, again, the ready or not, the ready wise, the not foolish. Five of them were foolish, five of them were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps. But the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and they literally all fell asleep. But verse 6, at midnight... At midnight, they were aroused by a shout, look, the bridegroom is coming, come out and meet him. And all the bridesmaids got up and they prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to the shop, buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. And the door was closed or was locked. The door was closed and locked. Verse 11. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back to them, believe me, I don't know you. And now verse 13. Verse 13 is basically this. The point of the whole story. This is why I told you the story, Jesus says. When he comes to verse 13, he says, here's the point. Here's the moral of the story, if you want to say it that way. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. Ready or not, here I come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray you anoint. Lord, when we say anoint, we mean you direct, you teach, you make, you open our minds, you, you help us see application to our personal lives. Lord, we just ask that, that something supernatural happens through not just talking words, but preaching words. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that we get more than information, we get more than something that we say, oh, okay, I learned it, I don't need to learn it again, but we get food that nourishes, that will just need more and more of that food in our lives. 
So nourish us, Lord, in our walk with you by the preaching of the word today so our faith may grow. And Lord Jesus, we may draw closer to you so that you do find faith when you return again. And we pray this all, believing for it all, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. If you're going to have, let me, let me talk to you as Christians. Let me talk to you as a person who I would assume that either you are or you're at least pointed in the direction of wanting to be a Christian. Now, a Christian is going to be a one, to, to really call them a Christian, they have to be fully operational. Um, you can have a car, but if it's broken, it's got four, four flat tires and the engine seized and all sorts of problems. Well, you've got a car, but you don't have a car. You've got a car that is non-functional. I don't want to have non-functional Christianity. I want to have functioning or operational Christianity. Well, to say that then, there are four major things that every operational Christian should operate their Christian life on a daily basis by. Every one of these should be like just sitting on the counter ready to grab at any moment in your life. Let's put the four that are up there. They are Jesus saves, Jesus heals, Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit, Jesus is coming again. Now you might say, oh, well, those are just four doctrines. Those are just four things. But no, I mean, every day I need to make sure that I'm forgiven of everything that I maybe should not have done or should have done but didn't do. The two sides of, of, of doing wrong before God. The one is I did what I shouldn't have done and the other is I didn't do what I should have done. God, every day I need you to help me. Every day because I'm not just body, but body, soul, and spirit. I need a touch of God to heal me where it got broken, it got hurt. Anybody hurt at Calvary? When I say hurt, you were hurt by somebody else. Not just hurt like, ouch, I, I hit, hit my thumb with a, a hammer or something, but something like, you, know, you got to hurt on the inside. Hey, Jesus heals. And then, and then I've got to live this life that the Bible has asked me to live. And sometimes I feel so weak and so, so inadequate, but then all of a sudden I remember, but Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit. He gives me the power by the Spirit indwelling in me. These are not insignificant thoughts. These are huge. And then if I come down to this one, we're going to find out today why this is huge. Why these four should be on the counter, accessible any moment of any day that Jesus is coming again. If you take your Bible and read from Genesis to Revelation, from Revelation back to Matthew, jump over to Malachi, go back to Genesis, then go Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, number, I'll stop right there, and keep going on and on, here's what you're gonna find. All four of these are just like every place in the Bible. Every, even in the Old Testament, yes, it's every place in the Bible. But today, we talk about Jesus coming again. So three simple points to make your Christianity operational in yes, all four, but especially now, uh, considering today's sermon, to be ready when he comes again, to be ready because he is coming. Number one, number one, you are scheduled for Jesus' coming. His, it is scheduled. It is scheduled. You got a calendar app on your phone. You got a book and you, know, you write your appointments in, something like that. Now, you don't know it. It's written in invisible ink or the link is uh, something weird. But there is a day, there is a time, there is a moment when your feet will lose the gravity that holds them to the ground. You're just going to go up, up and away. You are got, you, without a cape, you are going to take off. You are, you are just going to, you are going to go because it's called the rapture. One day, Jesus is coming again. Can you say amen to that? Well, not everybody knows it. There are some people that don't know it. So Malik, I'm um, sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. But let me reveal to you, Paul says, this really cool, this really neat, this wonderful secret. Everybody loves secrets. Tell me a secret. You got a secret. You know, most of the time we shouldn't listen, but ah, this time you should listen. What, what, what is the secret you got for me? What, what do you want to tell me? Here's a secret that literally, if you live on a block of 20 houses, I don't know how many, even 
except your house knows about it. Maybe a few houses know about it. It says, we will not all die, but we will all be transformed. What a cool word. It will happen in a moment. It will happen in the blink of an eye. Can you blink your eyes? Could you just do that? Just, you're just staring at me. No, just blink your eyes. Just, you know, you know you're gonna get dry eye there. So listen, and when the last trump shall blow, I, I don't play the trumpet, so I won't do that for you. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we, so if it happened to happen right now, we who are living will also be transformed. Oh, praise the Lord to that. Praise the Lord to that. Let me give you, first and foremost, on this schedule of Jesus coming again, the greatest tool you can have to be ready for him to come again, to be ready for the schedule of Jesus coming in. I want to give you the greatest tool. There are so many tools, or let me say it this way. There are so many benefits when you come to Jesus. There are a thousand. There are 10,000. I don't even know if I'm, I'm supposed to put a limit on that number, but there are so many benefits. But what is first? What is foremost? First and foremost, of the many benefits in Jesus is that you've moved from death to life. You've moved from death to life. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that Jesus died on the cross so that the sins that kill our spiritual inside can be erased, taken away, the effect of them forgiven is the good word, and then our spiritual inside can come alive. We come alive. Now, to put that another way, we're gonna read John, the fifth chapter, verse 24, from the message translation. Again, these are, these are uh, Jesus' words when he says, it's urgent that you listen carefully to this. Anyone who believes what Jesus, or what I am saying, because Jesus is saying these words, what I am saying right now, and aligns himself with God the Father, who, was, who has in fact put me in charge, has at this very moment the real lasting life and is no longer condemned to be an outsider. This person has taken a giant step. Every person who receives Jesus has taken a giant step. What is the first giant step they have taken? It's that final line. They have, look at it, they from the world of the dead to the world of the living. If somebody decided to just drop over and die in the middle of our service, please, if you're thinking on doing that, don't do that. Wait till you get home. It'll cause a lot less confusion, okay? But let's just say somebody decided to do it right here in the middle of our service. I think I'm just gonna die today. They drop to the ground, ah, we're all sad, we're praying for them, but we call 911, they rush in, the paramedics come in, they say, I'm sorry, he's gone, he's gone, he's gone, but we keep praying, we keep praying. I'm sorry, he's dead, he's dead. We keep praying, we keep, he's dead, we keep praying. I could say that a few times. We keep, but fine, boom, he comes alive. I mean, there'd be some dancing in the house. There'd be some like, whoa. There'd be like, wait a minute. That guy went from the land of the dead to the land of the living. And then we'd think he was special, like some Lazarus among us, when in fact, I just read to you from John the fifth chapter that said anybody who has taken the giant step to receive Jesus as Savior has gone from the land of the dead to the land of the living. You are a living Lazarus. You are, here I am. Take off my grave clothes. I am, you are a living Lazarus. Can you say amen to that? Now, I said all that to say that once you become that Christian, and it's always good to talk about the process of, of asking Jesus into your heart so your sins can be forgiven. But once that happens, you know one of the things that you will find after that person takes that giant step and comes into the land of the living? The first thing as God puts into them, takes out their heart of stone, puts in a heart of flesh. And I, I, it, this is across the board. It never fails. When a person has that, 
they automatically want to, they want to love Jesus more. They, they want to, they want to, Lord, I know who I am. I know the failures I've done. I know my weaknesses. But Lord, if you're asking me what I really want, even in spite of myself, I want to love you more. I want to love you more. And praise the Lord when we start talking about loving God more. And of course, when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love God more. Love the Lord thy God with all. And I mean, we know we're, we've fallen short of the all, so we know that's more. So God, help me to love. So Jesus answered the question of what God wants from any of us by saying, start by loving God with every fiber of who you are. Now, somebody who's thinking right now is saying, yeah, this is good, Pastor, but weren't we supposed to be talking about the second coming? Yes. Yes, we are. Because the greatest tool any Christian can have to be ready for Jesus to come again is to have a heart that wants to love him more. You are headed in the right direction when your heart wants to love and it starts to accomplish that more love. That is what Jesus wants to find in any and all of us when he shows up. When he shows up and you're taken up and you just, he's right here and you're right here and he says, hey, I'm glad you're here. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy. And I'll tell you what I'm most happy about, Jesus would say, that you are wanting to love me more and more every day. You want to be ready for Jesus to come again. Love him more and more every day. Love him more and more every day. Sometimes we think it's, it's this and that and it's so hard and, and everything else and I don't know if I can do it. But your greatest resource will be when Jesus comes again that your heart is ready for him. So then Matthew 24, 42, watch therefore. Watch therefore. Come on, watch. Pay attention. Do it. Let love awaken you to the fact that Jesus is coming again soon and that you will watch. You know, the, the spirit is willing, and that's kind of what we're talking about now, but the flesh, but the more you want to love Jesus, the more the spirit overcomes the flesh. Watch, therefore, you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Number two, number two then. So if we've we got this heart, we've got this tool, we want to serve Jesus more, let me ask you then among us, who is waiting for Jesus to come again? Are you? Are you? This, let's, let's clarify here for a moment. Are you waiting? And we'll go back to what Jesus said just a moment ago. Now, you know, interesting, most of the time in the Bible, listen to this, most of the time in the Bible, they say Jesus is the groom, we are the bridesmaids. Uh, bride, bride, rather. Let me, let me say it again. We are the he is the groom, we are the bride. Most of the stories in the Bible are portrayed that way when they're trying to teach a lesson. But interestingly enough, this particular parable, you and I become the bridesmaids. That's a little bit different, but it's to learn the lesson. So, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story, Matthew 25, 1, of 10 bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Now, to understand the parable, you got to understand the role of a bridesmaid in that day. You kind of get it in this day, but do you know what it was in that day? In our modern times, our typical wedding is usually held in a church. Uh, not always, but a lot of the time, especially among Christians. And there's usually an exact time printed on the invitation. 2 p.m. is very common. 2 p.m. So we have a 2 p.m. wedding going on, and I'll tell you what, there's an exact time Nobody ever tells the bride that time. Nobody ever tells her. I'm telling you, I am just telling you, most brides, even if they get to the building on time, they are not ready to be on time. They need 30, 60, 90 minutes more. They've known for months, maybe years, this was going to happen. Some of them, since they were this, I'm going to get married, and I'm going to be Prince Charming. And they knew for years they were going to be. But no, 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 2 p.m. Well, anyway, let's go on. 
Now, here's something interesting. I don't know if there is any correlation to this in the modern wedding and the second coming of Jesus, but I have done, and I don't know that I've done 200, 200 weddings, but let's just say 200. If I have done 200 weddings, never once in 200 weddings, never once has the groom been late. Never once. Never, and if anything, he gets here way too early and paces around and, and hey, you can't go out there, you might see her, get back here and, and all sorts of things. And, and so if, if you talk about a wedding, often it's that way. On the other hand, I would be hard pressed to remember the last time a bride walked through the door at 2 p.m. I just, I, I, I can't remember that. So just saying, just saying, if you are the bride of Christ, Jesus isn't going to be late. Just so give it your best not to be late. Or in the context here, ill-prepared for his coming. At this particular wedding that Jesus is telling a parable about, the bridesmaids had one job. The job of the wedding was to watch for the groom to come. Now, again, ours is in a church, but theirs was more of kind of an open thing in it, in, in the home or in even a compound of where homes were. And the, the groom would be far away someplace and there were no phones, there were no uh, bus schedules or train schedules or anything like that. He just kind of came when he came. And so you didn't know the exact time he was coming. You maybe didn't even know the exact date he was coming, but you knew he was coming. Maybe in the day, maybe in the night. Who knows when he's going to show up but here's the deal, they needed to be ready. And the bridesmaids had one job. When he showed up, to go out, greet him, and then with much pomp and circumstance, escort him in. You need to go out, when he's coming, run out there quickly. With much pomp and stance, welcome him into the wedding feast, into the wedding ceremony or the whole everything that goes on. Ten women, there they were, ready and waiting. All ten, if you look around, all ten, they look identical. Oh, I mean, they were different ladies, but, you know, in so many, they just, they kind of all looked identical. All were dedicated to the goal, supposedly dedicated to the goal of welcoming the groom to come. But deep down inside, and now I'm preaching to you deep down inside. Deep down inside, five of the ten were not dedicated to his coming. How do I know they were not dedicated to coming? They weren't thinking ahead. They weren't saying to themselves, now if he comes at this moment, I need to have this ready. If he comes at this moment, I need to have this ready. If he comes at this moment, I need to have this ready. They weren't thinking ahead. They were not making themselves ready, no matter the time, no matter the length. Should Jesus come today? Should Jesus come 50 years from today? Is your preparation ready for him to come? Ready or not, at when he comes, he comes. Can anybody say amen? amen? But then he did come. There was a midnight cry. It burst forth. The bridegroom cometh. Praise the Lord. Or as you and I would say of Jesus, the king is coming. The king is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding and now his face I see. And you can't meet, it's midnight, so you can't meet the groom in the dark. So you got to get your lamp. You grab your lamp. Of course, you have, to have lamp, you have to have oil in the lamp for it to burn. And I know so often we speak of the oil in the lamp as the Holy Spirit, and obviously it is. And that's a very important part of, of this parable. But there could maybe be something else added too. Because the Bible talks about how the Bible is our lamp. So how will you be ready for Jesus to come? By being filled with the Holy Spirit, yes, but also by being in the Bible, living by the Bible, walking according to the ways of the Bible because it is a lamp unto our feet in the midst of a dark world. I say amen to that. Be filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit and carry faithfully obedience to the lamp that is the Bible. Thy word, Psalm 119, 105, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But we know the parable. And in the parable, five were ready, five were ready or not, they were the knots. 
and they didn't make it. And so it says in verse, we go to point number three, they missed their time to be ready. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Now, you and I, modern 21st century Americans, it just blows our mind that somebody had to be that, like, man, that's just so harsh. Do you have, I mean, you can't just open the door. Sorry, I'm sorry you missed it, but come on in or something. What? So we need to look at this another way. We need to kind of focus maybe another way because if, if we just keep it into all we had to do was open the door and let him in, we, we missed the point. Let's see what we'll do. Let's, let's look at this another way. We hold a wedding here at Calvary. Yeah, we got the two o'clock wedding here. Uh, many of you have been married here. That's kind of neat. Uh, what's really neat is when I, when I dedicated you as a baby, you grew up and then I married you here. Now that's really cool. That is really cool. That's been a, that makes you old. That makes you old, not, yeah, <laughs> that's right. So anyway, so let's just say we have our 2 p.m. wedding and, and do you know when you put 2 p.m., there are people who, they, they, they've got to be here by 1.15. They come in, they'll sit alone in a sanctuary. Just sit there. And I, I walk in and I'm awkward, they're awkward. You know, well, you know, oh, hi, oh, you, do you know the groom? Do you know, well, you know, well, it's only 45 minutes. Not really, I, I, I didn't tell him. It's, it's going to be forever. You really came way too early. But uh, anyway, so, so at 2 o'clock, the sanctuary starts to fill. Maybe you've invited a lot of guests. Ah, oh, the groom is here. His, his ushers are here. The bridesmaids start to show up and, and, you had a big wedding. You had 10 of them, and nine of them showed up. And number 10, you can't seem to locate. Where's number 10? Where's number 10? We can't get her. We can't get her. It's time to start the wedding. What are we going to do? But we're going to start. We're just going to start. I mean, we're not going to shut this whole thing down. We've got hundreds of guests. We've got all sorts of things. So, so we start it, and you know how it works. The, groom, the music starts to play. The groom and the pastor come out. We stand here like, you know, so, and, and then, you know, the, then the wedding party starts to come in. And, oh, you know, there's, depending on how they do it, whether it's the flower girl or, or, or the, um, the ring bearer or whatever, finally the bridesmaids come in. And then that moment comes, everyone stands up, bah, 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 and all of a sudden she comes in and all the ladies, mom's crying. And, oh, it's, it's, it's a great wedding. It's a great wedding. Who giveth this woman to this man? And, you know, it, it, and even dad gets a little like, <laughs> and, and, you know, um, and you know the whole story. You know the whole story. So then, uh, this, come on up here, face each other. Let me tell you about what God's intent for a man and a woman is. And, and okay, now what token do you offer? And rings, and let's say these vows, and I do. And finally, the big moment, uh, you know, Joe, you may kiss the bride. Oh, he's been waiting for this forever. And he gives her a kiss. And everybody's so happy. They're so thrilled. Then they go out and form. A, of course, everybody goes out. And they form this reception line that I think it's still going on now. It's so long. It is so long. And you finally get through. And now we all go to the reception hall. And they bring in all these different couples. And they announce everybody claps and everything. And and they have the dinner, and they have everything. You're getting this now, right? You're seeing all this that's happening, all of this that's happening. Finally, they cut the cake, smoosh in each other's mouth. They get the whole thing done at the very, it's almost down to the last second, and the 10th bridesmaid comes running in. Here she is. Here she is. Running in at that moment, at the very end of the wedding reception, comes in the missing bridesmaid. Oh no, she says, I missed it all. Can't we do it all over again? No. Isn't it true? No, we can't. Especially because it was by your own fault you didn't show up in time. It's not, you missed it. I don't want to seem harsh. I can't do it again. It's, it's way too, it's just not going to happen. 
It's not going to happen. In another parable about a wedding, Jesus said of the one not prepared, Matthew twenty two twelve. Friend, he asked, how is it that you're here at a wedding without wedding clothes? But the man just, I don't know why I wasn't ready. I don't know why I wasn't ready. I want to invite everyone to be ready for Jesus to come. He is coming again soon. It's not something we're supposed to fear. It's not supposed to, something we're supposed to dread. But it is something we're supposed to be ready for. And that should be motivated by our love for him. So if there's something that's not meshing, talk to God about it. Talk to God so this won't be like a uh, moment, but it'll be like, like you can really genuinely say, I want Jesus to come. Not like, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to say it, but I'm a little nervous about the whole thing. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we want to be ready for your coming. And we want to learn how to be excited Christians, not foolish, wise, not locked out, but, this is a neat thing, locked in to the, to the bride and the groom, locked into what God is doing. And yet, Lord, we know that one of the issues that every Christian, or at least Christianity and churches face, is the fact that so many don't feel ready or feel ill-prepared. Lord, we start with the fact that you give us the robe of righteousness. We don't earn that robe. We don't make it happen. We simply go from being dead, which a dead man can do nothing, into the land of the living by what Jesus has done. That's our forgiveness. But then there's those things that you ask us to do. And it's part of our free will. It's part of our saying yes to Jesus. It's part of what we sang about. I say yes, I say yes, I say yes. I give not 99 out of 100, but 100 out of 100. Would you say yes? So with heads bowed and eyes closed, let's take a moment for every person to review your personal understanding of the second coming, your, I don't know if the word is I want to use strategy, but your, your operational plan on how you're, how you're going to be ready for that. Is it biblical? Sometimes we think I was good enough to make it and only Jesus makes you good enough, but there's something about that love factor. And while you're praying about that, I will ask if there's anyone else in here who just absolutely feels like Jesus isn't their savior so they can't really claim readiness for his coming. And with that said, I want you to be ready today. Ready or not, well, remember I preached against the not and I preached for the ready. And the ready for any of us is to receive Christ as our savior. That instantly brings Jesus into your heart that instantly fills you with that oil now your responsibility to keep filling it but I'll tell you for today it would fill it so with heads bowed and eyes closed if you've not received Christ as Savior but you're ready to right now you're gonna to say to this pastor pastor I want to receive Jesus now with while others are praying I'm gonna ask you just to lift up your head and look at me and raise your hand just raise your hand and say pastor I want to be ready for Jesus coming again. Amen. See the hand. See another hand. There are probably others I'm missing. Are there any in the balcony? I'm just looking towards you now. Anybody else want to raise their hand? For those of you that raised your hand, I want you to know that right now, with this simple prayer, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Make me ready for your coming. May seem simple, may seem too simple, too elementary, but it's the way God has given his free gift of salvation to us. From there, he'll give you strength 
as we preached about with Jesus saves, Jesus heals, Jesus gives power by the Holy Spirit. He baptizes in the Spirit. He will help you. God will help you. So Lord, I pray for those that raise their hands. Right now, something dramatic would happen inside their hearts as they give it all to Jesus. Now, Lord, when the bridegroom does come, may this assembly, may these people have their selves set and ready, ready and excited and shout hallelujah as they take off into the sky. Bless them today as they live out their lives in every area for the Lord Jesus. So together we say yes, Jesus, yes. In the great name of Jesus we pray this morning. Amen, amen. and amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Be ready for his coming.